My computer's running really slow at the moment, so how can I speed it up? In the 1980s, the first computer I had really did run at a snail's pace, but we're not really talking about the 1980s now. We're talking about modern day computer systems which vary in speed from some sort of charging bull elephant to a cheetah. There are four different ways that we can speed a computer system up. We can either increase the clock speed of the processor, so increase the clock speed. That's the first thing we can do. Second thing we can do is use a multi-core processor. Multi-core processor, okay. Let's get that nice and clear. The third thing I can do is use a processor with more cache memory. And the final thing that I can do to speed a computer system up is to use a graphics processing unit to take the processing load for some parts of the computation off the CPU. So we'll look at these one at a time. Okay, so we'll start off with the clock speed. Let's move that up to there. Right, okay, so let's take a look at a uh, quick look at clock speed first of all. Uh, define what that is remind ourselves what that is hopefully anyway if you've watched the video on the CPU the components of the CPU you'll be familiar with the fact that the CPU has got a clock in it and the clock pulses to keep everything in time and it also controls the speed of the fetch decode execute cycle so literally the clock speed tells us the number of FDX remember that's fetch decode execute cycles that can be carried out that can be carried out per second All right so per second of time okay so what sort of speeds are we talking about here a basic microcontroller some of the very basic microcontrollers there remember found in microcontrollers found in embedded systems runs at a clock speed around about four kilohertz. These are the sort of the slowest ones. Now, what does that mean in practice? It means that the microcontroller can perform 4,000 FDX cycles per second. Wow, that's a lot, that's quick. That's 4,000 things in one second. Until you consider the latest Intel i9 processor, which is this kind of 2019 fastest which is an Intel, capital I for Intel, i9-9900, oops, 9900K processor, which comes in at a phenomenal 5 gigahertz, which is, wait for it, 5 billion FDX cycles per second. Wow, okay, that's fast. It's also cost quite a lot of money as well. The thing about microprocessors is when they start running fast, a problem occurs. If they get too fast, they also get too hot. And that's a massive problem for a desktop computer system. So it's crucial you understand that you can't just keep ramping up the speed of a microprocessor as fast as you want, because it will get too hot eventually. Let's look at, um, at what that looks like in its extreme as well. In around about 2011, so this is going back a few years now, around about 2011, a team of engineers from AMD, Advanced Micro Devices, managed to push an AMD FX8350 processor to overclock, that means increase the clock speed manually above its standard, to wait for it 8.429 gigahertz right that is phenomenally fast that's faster than this 2019 i9 9900k 8.29 the problem is to do that they had to use liquid helium to cool it at a temperature of minus 
225 degrees Celsius. Not really practical, to be honest, for most desktop PCs, but that is that pretty much, I think that still stands as the record, and there's videos on YouTube that show them doing it, pretty much the record. You cannot get a processor to go faster than that. It's impossible, okay? Well, unless you get it cooler, I suppose, but nonetheless. Right, the second thing I mentioned, if you can think back to that, was to use, instead of using a single core processor, was to use a multi-core multi processor. Okay, so what exactly does that mean? Right, when using a multi-core processor, you can share the workload of processing. So the workload is shared between discrete okay let me explain what that word means discrete or separate processing cores so instead of having a single processing core you have two four eight sixteen however many you can fit basically so processing cores right in the old days so we're talking the then and the now in the then you used to use multiple single core CPUs I remember an old computer system that I had that had um, a core, what was what was called a core processor in, in its day um, so it had a core a core processor in it single core CPUs uh, and the core processor did lots of the maths calculations and took the load off the main CPU to allow things to run a little bit faster so it could share it nowadays things are slightly different nowadays you use a single uh, CPU with multiple cores in it single CPU with multiple Again, if you watch the components of a CPU video, you'll have seen at the bottom when I was talking about cache memory, um, I, I showed a dual core processor basically in there. Right, um, I'm just going to show you a couple of screenshots, hopefully they'll appear on here in a second. Uh, the first screenshot, which I'll show you there, is from a fairly slow, oldish laptop that I've got which uses a Core 2 Duo CPU. Now the 2 in that means that it's it's a dual core processor so the processor itself has got two cores in it you can actually see that information from this little bit of the screenshot here so it's a 1.6 gigahertz speed processor has 1.6 billion operations FDX cycles per second there's one socket and that socket actually means that there's just one CPU sat in there but that socket's got two cores in it um, and I'll explain what the logical processors bit means in a minute so it's actually got two logical processors as well and you'll notice here, um, if you can see, it, it, meant, it, it describes what sort of cache memory it's got as well. So the cache memory is shown there. It's got level 1 and level 2 cache in it. 128 kilobytes of level 1 cache, not a massive amount, and 4 megabytes of level 2 cache, which is in there. This screenshot's from my main PC, the one I'm using now actually at the moment, which is a Core i7 processor which is this one, it's a Core i7 processor, running at 2.7 gigahertz. This one up here, I'll just go back to that, is running at 1.6 gigahertz, so it's running quite slow. This is running at 2.7, so it's speeding along a little bit. However, I wasn't putting it under much load when I was using it at, the, at this particular point when I took that screenshot, so it's only going to like 1.34 gigahertz, only 1.3 billion FDX cycles per second, merely trotting along. Um, but you can also see some slightly different information over here in this little portion of the screenshot where it says the processor is running at 2.7 gigahertz at its maximum load there's one socket two cores in it so it's a dual core but this is because it's a mobile processor most i7s have got four cores in them so just bear that in mind you know if you need to um, but it also has four logical processors this is to do with thread processing okay i'm not going to go particularly go into that now but it's, it's a, a, a methodology where, where processors can be designed to behave like they've got more than one core by breaking the cores apart. I'll come back to that in a minute when we talk about cache memory. Um, so uh, just, just bear with that a, a second. Now, the thing with, with multiple core processors, absolutely fine. Bang, bang another core in it, bang another three cores in it, whatever you're going to do. But it doesn't necessarily mean, so if I double the number of cores it doesn't necessarily mean that I'll double the speed and again 
that's absolutely crucial for you to understand it's not actually meaning doesn't mean that's what that means doesn't imply or doesn't equal a double speed the software that's written for these processors needs to be specially written to take advantage of so specially written to take advantage of the multiple cores the process and, and fairly crucially the processes that are ca being carried out by the CPU need to be and I'm going to make up a word here so I don't know if this is a real word or not parallelizable Whew, let's try and spell that para lel oh parallela I'm going to go parallela lizable right parallelizable throw that into your exam that's a cracking word as long as you explain what it means parallelizable let me let me give you some sort of context on this and, and, and try and explain exactly how that would look if I was trying to describe it so let's say that I had some sort of processes that I need to carry out some sort of calculations or you know whatever I was going to do I'm making a smiley face let's just say that and um, just to keep things nice and easy I can break up the jobs into eight bits one two three four five six seven eight and if I carry out those eight jobs I get a smiley face or whatever I'm aiming for whatever it can be now if there's a way of breaking those eight jobs up in it so it looks a little bit like this so I can do job number one and then job number one allows me to do job number three at the same time and that's what's crucial at the same time as carrying out job number one if it's possible to carry out job number two to lead to job number four being carried out then I can take advantage of a multi-core processor let's just carry on this uh, this analogy here if I could use jobs three and four then to to, uh, to finish off job five but at the same time as doing job five I could do job seven and I could combine those two jobs together to give uh, to allow me to do job six and then that would go on because I've already done seven to allow me to do job eight then that is absolutely fine as a process for parallelizability that's an even longer word I've made up to generate my smiley face so that's absolutely fine okay so there's a smiley face however if there is no way that I can break the jobs down in such a in such a fashion that I can carry out two at a time in other words if I've got to do job one before I can do job two before I can do job three uh, before I can do job four before I can do job five you probably get the idea but I'm going to carry on anyway before I can do job six and then seven and then okay and then eight right if I cannot in any way force those jobs to be parallel processed then I can't take advantage of, of a multi-core processor so just bear in mind that it, it has to be a parallelizable job it has to exhibit parallelizability not even a word but I'm going to keep it anyway right okay let's move on to look at the third type of um, a, a thing I can change which is by altering the amount of cache memory cache memory okay cache memory again if you remember from the components of a CPU video which if you haven't watched I would really suggest that you watch it uh, stores recently fetched so again this is crucial that you understand the fetch decode execute cycle as well fetched data okay including the memory addresses so that's how the CPU would know that it had fetched it once recently already because it would compare the memory address it's looking for with one that's already in the cache and then it wouldn't need to fetch it from RAM uh, to prevent so stores recently fetched data including addresses to prevent it having to be fetched from RAM again to prevent it having to be fetched from random access memory uh, which is slower it's still fast but you know it's slower now um, okay let me show you another example of what this might look like in practice this is the diagram which um, I, I showed you when in the um, I keep mentioning it components of a CPU video okay so you've basically got the CPU which is here so this green box is the CPU 
and if possible <clears throat> we need to keep as much data inside the CPU as we can to avoid the CPU having to go to the slow RAM which is over here. I mean in my laptop I've got quite a lot of RAM in there, I've got 16 gigabytes of RAM in my laptop so there's a lot of RAM okay and it's not particularly that RAM's slow it's just it's slower than fetching the data that's already been fetched from the cache memory. Um, now if you look at the screenshot over here you'll see a few things okay so we've basically got one socket that one socket bit there is the whole CPU the second bit is the number of cores that are in there now the cores themselves if I just try and show you uh, try, I'm going to try and relate the colors of these to the bits of the CPU so that's the first core and that's the second core apologies for using green it's quite difficult to see that isn't it but hopefully you can see that the green core is there now I said I'd come back to this thing about logical processors basically the CPU can be designed to look as though, to behave as though it's got more than one core using what's called multi-threading. So it's almost like you can split the CPU into, into each, each core into two cores, logical cores, and we'll call them one, two, and then three and four. So those are the three, the, sorry, the four logical processes that it shows there. Right, okay, and then the last thing that we've got on here, which I think I want to do in red, because I've not used red yet on this one, oops, is the, oh, not that bit, sorry, apologies, is this bit here, which is the cache memory. Okay, now you'll see, hopefully, uh, <laughs> I don't know what happened then, right, we'll see, we'll try that again, third time lucky, there you go. Right, now you'll see, hopefully, here, that the level one cache, which is this one, is um, 128 kilobytes so that's this memory here 128 kilobytes it's not a lot but it's you know it's a reasonable amount okay we're going to go for this one which is the level 2 cache which is there which is 512 kilobytes and finally we're going to go for this one here I'm going to use purple again which is the level 3 cache which is 4 megabytes You'll notice that the level 3 cache is shared between the two physical cores or the four logical cores. And that allows core 1 and 2, or core 1 physical core, to use um, data and that's been fetched by the, the other core. So again, it, it kind of helps the processes to support each other and, and, um, and kind of help each other out. Now, what's the limit to this one, to cache memory? Okay, so I've done a bit of research and I've found what I believe to be the highest spec processor I could uh, I could find on the internet, which is this fella, which is an Intel Xeon Platinum processor. All right, so this is an uh, this is an Intel. They're all made by Intel. These things, Xeon. It's a server processor. Actually, this so it's not the sort of thing you'd get for your desktop computer. It's the thing you'd get in a really high-end server. Oops, it's got Platinum on. Okay. Platy, 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 num, plat. That's it. I was about to say, okay, it's platinum. It's a. It's an eight two eight T L. Right. Okay. It's an eight two eight zero L. So you're gonna have to save up for this. When you find out how much it costs. So this is the an eight two hundred. Right. It's got. Wait for it. This is mad. This is bonkers. This is the the best. This is probably the most highly spec processor that you can that you can buy that money can buy. Right. Wait for these specs here. Right. This fella has got not not two, not four, not eight. It's got twenty eight individual processing cores. Go on. Twenty eight of them, which gives it because each core can be split into two. Fit logically fifty six logical cores, logical processors. So it's like 28 of my laptops, basically what we're saying there. Now, clock speed wise, of course, we know that if you, chuff, if you shove clock speed up too far, you, you get massive cooling issues. So it only runs, only, it only runs at 2.7 gigahertz, this. So it's not massively fast, but it has got 56 cores. And it's got, and this is mind blowing, 39 megabytes of cache memory. And you're like, wow, 39 megabytes of cache memory. That's like um, eight mp3 files mp3 songs 39 megabytes mine's got four megabytes so you can see it's like t nearly 10 times the size of the cache memory all right so i'm going to get me one of them to put in my in my laptop that would be all right 
if I'd got £13,780 to spend. Whoa, I haven't. Okay, I think I mentioned one more thing, um, which is a graphics processing unit or a GPU. Now, graphics processing units are pretty fundamental things when it comes to data processing, like, like chunking data. So we're going to go for, um, where am I now? Graphics, GPU, graphics, or graphical, I suppose people might, what some people might call processing unit. The thing about graphics processing, so these are like games and you know, high-end design software, is that the processing tasks are all very similar. You just have to do a heck of a lot of them. Now, they tend, GPUs tend to have very fast, dedicated RAM. Special RAM, dedicated, which has got incredibly low access times, fast access speed. So fast, dedicated RAM, okay. They are designed to be massively, and just wait until you see the specs on this, massively parallel. Double L, one L, so P A R A double L E L. They're designed to be massively parallel, okay, or to have a massively parallel architecture. Right, get that. They carry out simultaneous, so non dependent, so one task doesn't necessarily depend on another one being finished first, similar tasks so it might be drawing lines right so it might be drawing lines on a screen but if you think of a, of a game it might have to draw 10 million lines on a screen all right so it's a lot of tasks the tasks themselves are quite easy to do but it just has to do a lot of them right so it has to be it has to be able to do these things really really quickly but at the same time and the basic thing about gpus is they're designed to remove processing load off the cpu uh, off the CPU. Okay, and they are used, as I've alluded to, for image processing, games, image processing, games, that sort of thing, and also for data processing tasks. There's, um, you know, with big data and the amount of data that um, sensors data processing, the amount of data that sensors are generating you know, all the time, automatic sensors are generating gigabytes of data every second. They need very fast processing tasks to, to do lots of really simple things at the same time so they can get through the data sets themselves. Now, again, last little bit of research I've done here and then we'll finish up. Oh, there it comes at the bottom. This is uh, what I've found to be the fastest G, uh, GPU currently available, the fastest GPU currently available, so I'll just chuck that up at the top of the screen right there. This is an NVIDIA, and don't they just make the best video cards? This is an NVIDIA, right, it has a lowercase n at the beginning by the way, Titan RTX, so it's a Titan RTX, and I'm sure that's one of some of you have got one of these. Ha! I wish I had one. But um, as you'll see in a minute, there's no way I can afford one of these. It's a Titan RTX. Um, it's not massively quick. All right, okay, modest 1.8 gigahertz processing speed. It's about a little bit faster than my cheapy old laptop that I've got. But, and this is, this is mad. It's got more than 5,000 processing cores. I'll pause to let that sink in. How do they fit them on a ch on, 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 in a graphics card? Got no idea. It's also got 24 gigabytes of really, really hyper fast RAM as well. So it is specced up to do re loads, like over 5,000 jobs at once. And it's run, it can do 1.8 billion jobs kind of clock cycles per second and it can store a heap of RAM in there. But, as you can imagine, it's gonna set you back a little bit of money. 2,399 quid, that's what you're gonna to have to spend for that. Wow, I mean, that is, a, that is a mammoth list of stuff to get through there, but I've, I've kind of tried to condense the impact of, of clock speed, multi-core processing, caches, and GPU on, um, the performance of a computer system and that's what we're doing so hopefully fingers crossed 
we've answered the question we set off to answer at the beginning. How can I speed up my computer? Right, basically, three factors which can affect the speed of a CPU. Clock speed, boom. Cache, boom. Number of cores, boom. And also, GPUs can be used to assist CPUs for intensive data processing. Finished.